Jazzy guys, that's us. Yes. All right. Welcome, everyone. Join me, if you will, in an opening uh, word of truth, treatment, spiritual mind treatment, prayer, whatever you want to call it. Here we go. There's only one power. That power is God. That power is life itself. It is the stuff. Everything is created out of and made of itself and nothing else. Therefore, all of us, each of us, are expressions of that divine. We're expressions of that one power. So we are good, all good, and nothing but good. Therefore, I am here today to celebrate the life of each of us, to celebrate life itself, and to celebrate being alive in this gorgeous, beautiful day. Knowing that that is what we're about and where we are, I release this now, letting it be the truth, and so it is. So we're changing it up a little bit today. We're glad to have Tom back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes. Yeah? You all agree with me? Yeah, okay. I mean, if you don't, don't clap. But we don't want him to get, you know, too much. Anyway, there's a, a, if you're here for the first time, then we give you a special warm welcome. And uh, if you're here for the 499th time, we give you a special warm welcome as well. So whoever you are and why ever, why ever you're here or whatever your frequency, we're really glad to have you with us. This is a place where you are appreciated, where you're loved, where you're respected for who you are. Uh, because we know each of us are expressions of the divine, our individuality, our individual expressions of life <clears throat> are what really manifests and demonstrates this one power we talk so much about. It's one power expressed as you, because it can't be anything else but you. And it's rich and it's wonderful and it's whatever your background, wherever you come from, wherever you're going, whatever's next, you're the special expression of the divine for now and for this experience. So I'm glad you're here. You're welcome. And uh, so it is. So let's, let's join, if you will, in our Declaration of Principle. This is a uh, piece written by Ernest Holmes. So I invite you to stand and read with me. I believe in one God, one absolute power, and first cause to all things. I believe that this power is perfect love, and it creates out of a desire to express love. I believe all thought is creative, and how I choose to think creates my personal experience. I believe in the unity of all life and the immortality of the individual soul forever unfolding. I believe in the eternal goodness, the eternal loving kindness, and the eternal givingness of God to all. Thank you. You may be So it is. Yes. Now, the, um, uh, as you know, every week we have a practitioner that comes forward. A practitioner is someone who is trained in this, in this teaching of, one, the, of oneness, of new thought, of science and mind, and are licensed by our organization to provide service to you and to themselves. They, they are licensed because they know how to use this treatment, this um, <laughs> teaching, for themselves and for other people. And they do that well, and they do that with great uh, benefit to all, all of us. So each week we have a different person up here, and today it's our uh, not only vice president of the board, but also one of our wonderful practitioners, Lee Huffman. Take it away, Lee. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. I moved out of the way so that I wouldn't be standing in front of things while you were seeing the <laughs> words up there. Ah. Uh, but uh, welcome. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, today there's some type of entertainment thing with advertisements uh, this afternoon or this evening. And my kids and I are getting together for that, and they're going to watch people throw the football around, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, my dad used to say that on the 2nd of February, the groundhog sees his shadow. Then if he sees his shadow, then it's six weeks more of winter, which is very important when you live in Indiana. And if he doesn't see his shadow, then it's only a month and a half. And I never understood that statement, but there we are. <laughs> And then this is also the beginning of the season for peace. And Bob's going to talk about that a little bit more, I think. Um, but I want to talk about, we do a reading, and I want to read something that we all just read together, or just a part of it. Sometimes we read something every Sunday, and it doesn't really 
set in anymore. So I want to emphasize something here that says, I believe that all thought is creative, and how I choose to think creates my personal experience. You know, this last year has been difficult for me. And um, some of you have come up to me and said, how come you're not here? (laughs) And I appreciate that. It made me feel really welcome. Some of you came up to me and asked, why don't you stand up when the practitioners stand up? And it got so difficult last year that I had trouble with those words, believing that I had created the crap that I was in. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But with help from Bob and my other support practitioner, miniatures are practitioners too, which is Paul Gagne, and lots of people here, I realized, you know, it did work that way. For several years, I was thinking a certain way. I was concerned about my health getting worse, and I thought about it getting worse, and I had a heart attack. I was concerned about things going on in my business and letting things go, and sure enough, my business went down. And various other things in my life that I won't go into here, because it would take us till the Super Bowl (laughs) to get through it all, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) went on and on, and Bob wouldn't appreciate me going through the details. So, Mm -hmm. But it was... Interesting, and then I came across something that um, actually a practitioner who now lives in Key West told me, and she pointed me to a section on um, in the Science of Mind textbook about metaphysics and, and physics, and um, it ties into the words that we read today, and it says on page 86, our belief is that anything the mind thinks, it can unthink. If, therefore, by the law of cause and effect, we have produced unpleasant conditions, we should be able, by the same law, to produce an entirely different effect, a different outcome. And so the first Sunday of January, Doug had put together the music and the uh, videos, and I heard a song that I'd never heard before. It was called Everything New. And that's my theme for this year, is everything new. And it's coming together. Lots of things. I feel healthier than what I have in 15 years. Uh, New Year's Eve, I wore a tux that I hadn't worn to an event that our buddy Tom was playing at um, that I hadn't worn for 15 years because it didn't fit me. And now things are a little bit loose. People are asking about that, too. I'm healthy. It's fine. It's all good. (laughs) It's good. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and so it's um, been really good. A lot of good things happening. And so um, I'm going to probably disappear a little bit more this year. Um, I'm going to be doing some traveling, and that's going to be good. So anyhow, I wanted everybody to think about the fact that if there's something going wrong in your life, or if you want just something better to go in your life, we can make that happen. We have that power. That's what this teaching is all about. So if you would... Let's do a spiritual mind treatment, an affirmative prayer. If you're new to this teaching, a spiritual mind treatment is nothing more than a prayer that is stated in an affirmative manner. And I'll speak it in my own words. And you can take it into your mind, any part of it that fits for you. And if it doesn't fit, let it go. So know this with me, if you will. I know that there is one God, one source one first cause to everything that exists, everything. That source wanted to create so much that it created love. It created the ability to express itself. So it created each of us, it created me out of love. And there was no other matter, no other energy for it to create out of except itself. So when it manifests me as a child, I was part of it and I am still part of it. And it is omnipotent and omnipresent and inside of me. Therefore, 
whether I like it or not. My words have power. My thoughts have power. My thoughts create the existence around me. So as we put the first month of this year behind us, and we look forward to the coming months, I know that this power is within me to create something better, to bring something new, to bring everything new if I desire into my life. And so I look forward to what I'm going to create. I look forward to what I'm going to manifest along with first cause because I am the first cause of my life. Nothing can get in the way of my creating what I desire and deserve. I know this is true. Every word that I speak, every thought that I think forms the world around me. So I look forward to it. I am happy about what is coming. I am grateful for what I have. And life is so good that I release these words knowing that today is a day that I move forward and that all comes as I desire. And together we say, so it is. So it is. Know what I'm doing? Making love. Yep. You get the gold star or the extra hug. Making love. The thing we are most here to do, it is the thing which brings us the greatest satisfaction. It's interesting that whenever a, um, a new minister starts out, their very first ever talk, always, it isn't, it isn't in, stated anywhere that it ought to be this way, it just happens this way, that they talk about love. Love is that thing that people want to, you know, we just, we get, you can, I, have, I have like enough notes here for about three days, and we aren't going to do that, but it's there. Because there's so much to say and so much to think about and so much to feel about this whole thing called love. And everything we do and everything we think and whatever aspect of love you're thinking of, it's all coming out of that one special place where the only place you can make love is in your consciousness, it's in your mind, it's in your heart, it's in your feelings, it's in your thinking, it's in your knowing. That's where we do it. Love is not something you get. You can't go get it somewhere. It's not a commodity you can buy off a shelf, despite the fact that our, our world is full of all sorts of places. I used to go to a lot of them, still do occasionally, where people are out there trying to get that commodity. You know, if I'm dressed the right way, if I look the right way, if I'm saying the right thing, if I show up with the right right music, if I know how to move the way I'm supposed to move, all of that, then I might just actually get some love. Well, you can't get love that way. All we can do is create it. Actually, we don't even create it. We tap into it. We tap into the flow of it, the, the existence of it within us, and then we live from that place. We bring it. We bring it. It's a one piece. There's, love's not two different things. It's not like here, there's something over here you can get, and then there's something over here you can give, and they're separate. You know, I, you, you remember the book years and years and years ago, Women Who Loved Too Much and the Men Who Loved Them? It was a rich and a wonderful book in many ways, but you can't love too much. And what they're really talking about in that isn't loving too much. It's giving too much beyond the fact from love, or giving beyond the awareness of what the, is really in their capacity to do. Love is, love is something, it's a wholeness, it's a oneness. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an energy that you live within. It's an energy that moves through you. It's an energy that you're created of. 
and that you get to participate in for the rest of our lives. You get to, we get to, we all do. We don't have a choice. And how we do our loving has a lot to do with what we think and feel and believe. So there's some things to look at. The, the, the definition of, of love is that it's the givingness of God through its creation to all of its creation as a creative process. Love is a creative process. And it's a creative process that comes out of who we are and what we want and how we want to live. And way too often it gets tangled up in what we don't have. And we think we're, we're lacking it. Well, you may be. You may be lacking the experience of it in your everyday living. And if that's true, then the solution is simple. You've got to create some more of it. When my granddaughter was really young, she, she was talking to her mom, and was, her mom was like out of cash or something. And, and Sophie says, well, just, just go to the wall and get some more. Because it's right there. You put it in your card, and it comes out of the wall right there for you. We do it every, all the time. See, and love is like that. Just go to the wall and get some more. Because you already have it all anyway. What we're really doing when we go to the wall is awakening to that within us, which allows us to, to experience what we already have. That one wholeness, that one peace. But what gets in the way? Stuff gets in the way, right? When you don't feel love, or when you think you're not loved. Or when things happen to you that may not be love, you're like, how'd that happen? Kind of like Lee's question about, how did, you, how did this all happen to me? Habits of thought, habits of thinking, habits of, fee of feelings, old wounds. If you've been harmed in some way in your earlier life, then that gets carried into your present life as a belief system. And you may have all sorts of ideas and messages about love from those earlier times. I used to say, I, you know, I thought crumbs were banquets. If people gave me a little bit of niceness, I thought it was a banquet. Because I, I didn't expect the fullness. As you see, I'm doing fine with the banquet part. But, and I'm doing fine with the love part now. But it took a while to get past those beliefs that were embedded in me in childhood about who I wasn't and what I did or did not deserve. Because we have this huge message that we get that says, love is about deserving. But there's nothing in the definition to that effect. Givingness of life, the givingness of God, the givingness of spirit by, of itself, to itself, through us, is love. Not because you deserve it, not because you did all the right stuff, none of that, but because you know it and you believe it and you create it in your own consciousness. That's where we create. We create in consciousness. We create in our thoughts and our beliefs. One of the reasons we have trouble with love sometimes is we fail to see who's loving whom. Or is it whom's loving who? Anyway, one of those. <clears throat> we fail to realize that as in that loving business, that loving experience, it is spirit loving itself. It is us loving each other as spirit. So it's not about the individual person. It's not about me being a loving enough person or you being a loving enough person or that person that you're loving deserving it. It is about us creating a sense of love regardless of who the other person is and regardless of what we may think about ourselves where we love and we desire the givingness. We want to give of life the goodness and the joy. Loving someone is about see, believing in them having their good regardless. A good according to their idea of it, not your idea of it. That one's hard sometimes. See, we, we, don't, and we, also, we, we have trouble because we don't always understand the languages of love. It was a great book uh, a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, by Greg Chapman on the languages of love, the five languages of love. And in that, he talks about uh, part of the problem in relationships is that we get hung up because we, we speak and feel a certain language of love individually. It's kind of innate in our personalities and what we, how we're raised and what we think of. 
and other people have different languages of love, and sometimes you get those together and they kind of don't fit. Uh, I went to visit my my sister and brother in law years ago in in down in New Orleans, and we were having a great time in the house, we're sharing and being together and talking and spending time. Except my brother in law was outside working in the yard, and we're all going, "What's up with him? Why isn't he here helping, having conversations, sharing with us? We know he loves us, we love him, but he's out there." My sister said, "Well, you know." That's him loving us. He's making that yard look absolutely pristine for you because that's his language of love. His language of love is action. His language of love is gift. My language of love is sitting and, and sharing and being together and having, having connection and community. There, there, are, there are five actions of love. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about them, but just... Just kind of notice if this is true about yourself. Because what happens is if someone else is speaking a different language of love, we may not get it. We were talking last night about languages at, at, at our, our uh, we had our holiday party for the board and the practitioners. And, uh, you know, a little late, but it was on the right time for us. And we, uh, people were talking about Spanish and other languages that they were learning. You know, I'm still working on English. Uh, so when people speak Spanish to me, I'm lost. I can get past, you know, I can get the taco and enchilada, and that's about it. I'm still working on other ones. So we find those languages, though, that we just don't understand. And with love and love languages, the same thing can happen. For some people, it's words of affirmations. People need to hear it. They need to hear, wow, thank you for that. You look wonderful today. I really love being with you. Well, they should know, right? We're all adults. You shouldn't have to tell people that. But the language is necessary for them to get it, to feel it, to know it. There's that language of quality time. That's my best language. You know, it almost doesn't matter what we're doing if we're doing it together. Then I feel loved and I know I'm experiencing and expressing love. But, you know, if, if that's not your language, why are we wasting time just sitting here doing nothing? So we find that language in between. Another language that's a really rich language for, for many people is receiving gifts. It's really important to get gifts for some people to feel loved. And if you're one of those people, then the simple little things like somebody bringing you a, a, giving you a candy bar. I mean, that's one of the reasons we have refreshments around here. So you receive a gift. You receive a touch. We get to touch each other through that method, through that way and that language of love. If, we, if, that's, if that's your language, that's very important to you. If your language is an act or acts of service, like for my, my brother-in-law, then uh, that matters. And he, and he cannot understand why anybody would not be pleased that he's out there cleaning the yard while we're sitting inside talking. No concept. And if you're in a relationship with someone where your language is perhaps time together and their language is acts of service, it's really important to learn those and to figure out and to talk about it and find ways to communicate it because love is rich and powerful and wonderful and impactful, but it's even more so when we can communicate it easily and freely to one another. And the last one is touch. Touch is a rich, beautiful language of love for, for many of us. Just a simple touch on the shoulder. Other people jump when you touch them on the shoulder. You know, it's not your language. Don't touch me. I doesn't feel loving. It feels intrusive. I don't need you touching me, or whatever it may be. Wherever you are, I'm I'm the touch. I'm okay with the touch part, please. That's part of my language. So so again, that gets all tangled up in our loving, and we get confused sometimes as to where the language starts and stops, and where the actual loving takes place in our consciousness and our creating it. It's not always easy to love. We are beginning this week um, the season. I, I changed the name of it. It's the season of nonviolence that the King Center put forward, and people all in, in religious groups all over the, the world really uh, uh, honor it. And it goes from the from Martin Luther King's assassination to Gandhi's assassination. 
as a 40 days plus uh, period of time. And what we're invited to do during this time is to spend some time each day practicing nonviolence. In this case, it's practicing peace. I'm changing the name of it from nonviolence to peace. I can't practice nonviolence, but I can practice peace. Pract Non-anything isn't active. In this teaching, what we know is we, we build on what is, not what is or what is missing. Nothing is missing about being nonviolent, but there is a great deal of power and positive positivity in our speaking of peace and knowing peace. And so each day, you're, you've got it in your programs, you have a little, a little suggested activity for that day to continue to focus on peace, to focus on nonviolence. In 1957, Martin Luther King delivered an, a, a very famous speech at the uh, Baptist Church in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And he said that, he was talking about, well, the title of the talk is Love Your Enemies. Those people that are hard to love. Love your enemies. And he said some very science of mind things about love in that talk. It was pretty rich. It's on YouTube, by the way, if you want to see the, the real one. Um, he said, <clears throat> why should we love our enemies? Why? What difference does it make? And his answer was that love is a power. It's not just a good feeling. It is a creative power that transforms people and redeems them from whatever pain and trouble they may be having. So that you, if you love your enemies or you love those you perceive as enemies, you begin to change their lives and you begin to change your life. He went on to say, or he, he actually starts out saying, how, so how do you do that? This is the part that's very science of mind. He said, well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to look at yourself and figure out why you have enemies. That's the uncomfortable part of this teaching for many people. It's the part where we get to be responsible for ourselves first and look at everything happening to us as an expression of who we are in some way or our distorted thinking or our mistaken thinking or whatever. And it may be larger, it may be individual, it may be the culture, it may be a big, you know, lots of big places. But his, his point was, start looking at yourself first. See what you have to learn. You get to learn from who your enemies are and why you even experience them as enemies or think of them as enemies. And then the second thing he said, in however intense that enemy may be in your mind, find something good about them. Get past the what's wrong. Now, I'm deliberately doing this today, not just because it's a season of nonviolence, but because we've just been through a few days in our, in our country of a whole lot of chaos for a lot of people. Depending on how you see what's going on politically, how you, how you care about the things that are happening. I'm not here to talk about politics, but I'm here to suggest that however you see that, if you're making an enemy out of anybody in the political world, then the call is to love your enemy and see them differently. And the way you do that is to find the good in them. The way you do that is to look at yourself first and then find the good in whoever you see out there as being somebody who's creating something wrong for you. Okay, you can breathe down. I'm going to move on. We're good. I promise. So as we do this, as we find these times, Jesus said it, love your enemy. Why did he say it? Because your enemies teach you about yourself. The people you perceive as being creating some problem for you are doing that because there's something in your consciousness that's showing up, that's saying, here it is. It's showing up as a mirror out there, and that mirror is that, quote, enemy, end quote. So then you get to look at our, we get to look at ourselves and decide, is this a something I want or not? Will I keep this or not? Will I continue to live under my own oppression or not? 
It's a rich, beautiful part of, of the Christian teaching. It shows up in almost all teachings, but it's definitely that one loudest. See, love is a power for good. We say all the time, there's a power for good in the universe and you can use it. There's a power for good in the universe greater than you are and you can use it. What if that power for good is love? What if the very essence and energy of your loving is the power for good? And it's not some special wacky woo-woo thing. It's just right there in your moment when you, when you see and appreciate and love your neighbor, your kid, your parent, even the ones that are harder to love. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? The beautiful thing about love is it is one piece. You can't give it without receiving it. You can't be in one side of it or the other. It's a one piece. So when you're experiencing it for something, towards something, you're receiving the benefit of that. And when you're experiencing it for yourself and about yourself, one of the... What is it today? Listen to this. Here's, here's the thing for today in, in the... the um, uh, season for peace. Caring. Caring. Real caring is not just what we say, but what we do. Make a list of at least five ways you can better care for yourself. And practice at least one of these today. Double dog dare you to try it. Because here's what happens. Here's what we know from... from Systems theory and working, and what I learned really working with, with folks who are addicted and, and their families and all the dynamics of that whole process is that if you want to take the very best possible care of the addicted person or the people in your family that are, are affected by addiction, the only way to do that is to take the best possible care of yourself and not get lost in the victimhood or the, or the sacrifice, or any of that, but to go to the place of self-care and self-love. And it's the hardest thing to teach. It's the hardest part of the system to break. Addi the, addiction, the addict oftentimes will get clean and clear of the addiction, but the family is still so addicted to being, to sacrificing, to giving up. To, to not taking care of themselves because they want, they've learned to take care of the other person and they have become caught in that self self flagellation self punishment self whatever so the power comes when 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 you can break the pattern by one person in the system saying I'm going to take care of me first and love me first because in doing that, all of a sudden, everybody in the family gets loved. They may not know quite what to do with it, but they get loved. See, it's a one piece. You get to practice self-love, and in practicing self-love, you are loving everybody around you. You are bringing greater love to the planet. You're bringing greater love to everyone that exists. And now, like every period of time, the world needs love. The old song, what the world needs now is slub, sweet slub. Well, it's not. It's just plain old love. It needs it to be recognized because it's not really absent in truth. It's just absent in behavior and experience. So I invite you to join me in making this a season of peace and an opportunity to experience and practice all of the colors of love as we're going to talk about them for over the next few weeks. Because you're wonderful. And so am I, and so it is. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. I'll hear later what that's about. Okay. So, tough stuff, maybe. I don't know. So go with me, if you will, into that place where love is created. The only place where love is created. That is in consciousness. 
turning away from the world around you and to the world within you. Not because there's a thing wrong with the world around you, but because you can more clearly focus on the world within. For this is the place where life is created, where life is experienced and expressed. This is the place where love grows and expresses and expands. And in this place, we recognize there is only one power. It is the power of love. It is the power of life. Another word for God is love. And so we honor and recognize this truth and we recognize that everything in us is calling us to love more, to love more freely, to love more easily. And we have within us everything we need in order to do that, to step beyond the limited thinking of us and them, right and wrong, good and bad. And step into the freedom of knowing that in some way, somewhere, somehow, our loving is powerful, it affects change in ourselves and those around us. And in this loving, we find great good Great good expressed for ourselves and great good expressed for others. And so we allow our minds to wander through the field of gratitude. Gratitude for the things that we are, for the things we have, for the things we've been given by so many people in so many situations. Wonderful, wonderful gifts. And we feel gratitude. And as we do that, we step further into greater joy, greater freedom, greater life. This is the truth of us. We let it be so. And so it is. Now, our board member, who is here to share with you and, and uh, lead us in the offertory time and the announcements, David Gibbs. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Okay. Uh, it's great to be here before you. Um, I've had the honor and privilege to be a part of this ministry for, I think, about five years now. And so as board members, we also wanted to be a part of inviting you to participate in this ministry in a much deeper way. And so during the offertory, um, we wanted to share a little bit about our experiences of not only what it's meant to be a part of this ministry, but more importantly, the role that we've discovered giving in this ministry has for us. And so I've got a few things that I wanted to share, observations, if you will, over my nearly 30 years of being a part of this truth and this teaching. We call it science of mind, but really it's ancient wisdom, kind of fashioned in very accessible language for today for us. And so there are colloquialisms that we use, things like it works if we work it. But I wanted to share observations to help you understand, well, what's underneath of that? What does that really mean? How do we apply that? So these are my observations over that time period. And it begins with the recognition that it's all paradox. The idea that two seemingly opposite things can coexist 
in complete harmony and unity. So observation number one, which is really the most recent observation that's gotten a little deeper for me, is the reality that, spiritually speaking, giving is receiving. So you hear the paradox in that, giving and receiving, but it's a truth that, like many universal truths, you learn at a deeper and deeper and even deeper level. Observation number two, that even though I'm looking for value in a church and a center in a pastor, it really boils down to me. And that it's all about me in terms of my thought world, my reaction to not just a lesson on Sunday, but even the idea of giving and sharing because we know there are opportunities in our lives, all throughout our lives, to actually give into creating the world that we want. So while we're looking for value in a church and a center, the reality is it begins in that moment of my awareness of what are the thoughts and the feelings that are coming up for me when I'm confronted with an opportunity to give. That is the crucible of my own learning. Number three. Observation number three, and there's six of them, so it won't take too long, um, is the reality that when I think about my thoughts and feelings, the coming into the recognition that giving in any other spirit other than gratitude and love and generosity is more than likely something other than giving. That is the gratitude out of which we give. It's the, the sense of generosity out of which we give, even if it's the smallest of amount, because it's more about what we invest in our giving than it is literally the amount that we might give itself. Number four, consistency is the key. It's not my highest thought. It's not my lowest thought that determines the direction and the nature and the orientation of my life. It's my most consistent thought. And someone is calling me my brother right at this moment. <laughs> it's my most consistent thought. All right, so we talk about raising our consciousness, and that's what raising our consciousness means. The consistency with which we can hold a thought or an idea in our life, allowing it to generate in our life. Number five has to do with this idea of tithing. You know, I was fortunate that by the time I understood what a tithe was, a tenth of your income, I didn't have the reaction that I've had later at times, which sounds like that is totally unreasonable. All right. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves at times, at times, most of us have at times felt like 10 percent was an unreasonable amount to give. And so a part of this journey is about making the seemingly unreasonable to be that much more reasonable and commonplace. It's intended to be a stretch amount. Now, I'm not encouraging or even inviting you to give a tithe or 10th percent. Is That's not where you can give what? With gratitude, love, and a sense of generosity. But I'm inviting you to think and toy with the idea of a tithe being a spiritual goal for the expansion of what? Not just this center of this church, but of my consciousness, my awareness, and my understanding of abundance. And that brings us to the sixth one and final one, and has everything to do with this idea of the connection between the head and the heart. You know, a lot of times the heart can lead us places that the head would not reasonably fashion. And likewise, the head can lead us places that the heart is actually not looking or wanting to follow. The idea is how do we bring that together? How do we strike a balance? So the whole idea of giving is about really recognizing what we're giving from as, a, as much as what we're giving to. And so with that, I want to invite you to take this opportunity to take a look at your thoughts and feelings in this moment and to give out of whatever space and place of love, generosity, well-being, and, 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 and goodness, if you will. So with that, I want to invite you to take your offering and to share.
in our offering of faith, it says, I live in a universe of abundance. As I freely and joyfully give, I join in the divine flow. And all that I share with life returns to me, multiplied abundantly, and so it is. Thank you.